Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 4 in the textbook of Sengel and Kajar. We've already completed the first part, which is the lump system approach. The very easy way of determining how the temperature in a body changes as a function of time. However, the lump system approach has a few limitations. The most important is that you cannot distinguish in a body the temperature distributions at different geometrical positions. The temperatures everywhere is the same. This, the lump system approach works extremely well and you get these uh, almost no temperature differences in bodies if um, the geometry is very small and the thermal conductivity is very high. Then the second part of this, of this chapter that we've that we've done and we, and we are almost finished with it is where we've looked at uh, 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 plain walls, long cylinders and spheres. We've looked at the theory of it, uh, the equations that were derived and typically how it can be made easier with certain assumptions. For example, if the non-dimensionalized time is larger than 0.2, then we only have to do the first term calculation and also if we are interested maybe in the temperatures in the center where x is equal to zero and r is equal to zero then there are also certain terms that disappear and it makes it makes it much easier to do the calculations now with the previous lecture we've looked at the case of a dead body and we've looked at uh, the lump system approach to see what the lump system approach will be in terms of what was the time of death of the body and we've also done it with a more accurate uh, analytical solution using a cylinder. I, also, I want to do another example now because with the previous example we've specifically looked at the temperature in the center. Now we are also going to look at the temperature at another position and the problem that I would like to do is the problem at the back of the chapter, uh, which is 461. And the problem says a 65 kilogram beef carcass uh, with a K value of that and alpha of that, initially at a uniform temperature of 37 degrees, is to be cooled by refrigerated air at minus 10 degrees Celsius, flowing at a velocity of 1.2 meters per second. The average heat transfer coefficient between the carcass and the air is 22 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Treating the carcass as a cylinder of a diameter of 24 centimeters and height of 1.4 meters and disregarding the heat transfer from the base and the top surfaces, determine how long it will take for the center temperature of the carcass to drop to 4 degrees Celsius. Okay. So we have to determine a carcass, a beef carcass, Initially it was 37 degrees Celsius and now it is being refrigerated in an environment with a temperature of minus 10 and the question is how long will it take before the center temperature is at 4 degrees Celsius. But then the second part of the question is also determine if any part of the carcass will freeze during this process. So if you can just imagine this body of 37 degrees Celsius being exposed to a temperature of minus 10, then most probably the point in the carcass where the temperature will be at the lowest will be on the outside surface, isn't it? Which is the closest to the minus 10. So the question is actually to also determine when the temperature is 4 degrees Celsius on the center, what will the temperature be on the outside surface? So let's do this problem. So the beef carcass, we are going to says we can assume it to be a cylinder and it says that the heat transfer rate from there can be neglected which means that we can assume it is insulated and therefore that the heat transfer rate is only in a radial direction. The initial temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, the mass 65 kilograms the thermal conductivity K is equal to 0.47 watts per meter Kelvin. 
alpha is equal to 0.13 multiplied by 10 to the minus 6 square meters per second and the CP value is equal to 4180 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So that's all the properties of the beef carcass. On the outside, the temperature is minus 10 degrees Celsius at T equals zero. The velocity of the, this air is 1.2 meters per second and the heat transfer coefficient is equal to 22 watts per square meter Kelvin. This dimension, the diameter, is 240 and that dimension, in terms of the height, is 1,400 millimeters or 1.4 meters. Okay, and we have to determine the time to drop the center temperature to 4 degrees Celsius. Okay. That's the first thing that we have to determine and the second thing is will it freeze? Freeze would mean the temperature anywhere zero degrees Celsius. You all understand the, the problem? Right. Now, with the previous lecture, I've showed you, well, not only with the previous lecture, the previous two lectures, I've showed you the three different solutions for the plane wall, the cylinder, and the sphere. And for the case of the cylinder, the solution is equal to the sum of n equal to 1 to infinite, 2 times lambda n, divided by the Bessel function of the first order in lambda n, divided by the Bessel function of the zeroth order, also in lambda n, plus j1 lambda n, and then multiply e to the minus lambda n square multiplied by tau. And the roots is lambda n is equal to j1 divided by lambda n divided by j0 lambda n which is equal to the Biot number. Okay, so to get values of lambda and j, one of the first things that we have to calculate is the Biot number. And the Biot number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the characteristic length divided by the thermal conductivity. Okay? And the characteristic length is equal to the volume divided by the surface area. All happy with that? No. Again, a trap. It's not correct. Remember, this is only valid for a lump system. It is not valid for any other body. So how do you know what characteristic length to use? Well, if you look at table 4.1 in the fine print, it will tell you that. It tell you that the Biot number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the radius divided by K. So, do not make that mistake. <coughs> the heat transfer coefficient is 22. The radius is equal to 0.12 divided by the thermal conductivity is equal to 0.47 and the Biot number is equal to 5.62. Well, it asks us to determine the time. 
So we cannot know what the non-dimensionalized time is at this stage. But we are going to assume the non-dimensionalized time is larger than 0.2. Why? Because then we can only use the first term approach. And the first term approach would be valid. And if you look in your textbook, you will see that this can then be simplified so that the solution for the first term approach is equal to the temperature at any point minus T infinite divided by Ti minus T infinite is equal to A1 e to the minus lambda 1 square tau multiplied by J0 alpha 1 R divided by R0. So, so that, that, this equation is in your textbook specifically for the one term where we've got we use the one term assumption assuming that tau is larger than 0.2. So, yep. Sorry? Uh, first term. First term approach. You can just write it out. So the first term approach, we use the first term approach if tau, if tau is larger than 0.2. We do not know if that is the case, but we make the assumption. If we make that assumption, then that is the solution for a cylinder. And we've got the build number, so therefore we can go to table 4.2. And in table 4.2, um, let, let me rather do it here. In table 4.2, you'll see it gives the build number, and then it gives the results for the plane wall the cylinder and the sphere. Like that. So you will see typically for build number of five, lambda one and A one, and that's again lambda one and A one, and lambda one and A one. Then lambda 1 is equal to 1.9898, A1 is equal to 1.5029. Okay, for those of you who've got your textbooks here, you can check it. Again, I would like to recommend that you start using these values on and looking for it, you know, and using your textbook on a regular basis because you need that exercise for, for the tests and the exams. Then for a build number of 6, it is equal to 2.0490 and 1.525 uh, something. Okay. So, the build number is equal to 5.62. I will be very happy in the exam if you use the value of 6. It's fine. You can, you, can make that as, you can make that assumption. If you want to go and do linear interpolation, you can calculate that as 2.027 or 1.517 if, if you solve it directly on, on your uh, pocket uh, computer or something like that. Okay, now, take note, many students are so anxious in the tests and exams, they typically get the build number and then they read these first two values. So if you read the first two values, it would be the values for a plain wall. So please be careful that you select, select it according to the geometry that you have to consider. Okay, now, <coughs> Let's look at this J0 multiplied by lambda 1 multiplied by R divided by R0 is equal to J1 lambda 1 mm, I've got a feeling uh, this should be A1 and then lambda 1 So 
Okay, so this should be A1 lambda 1. Okay. And that would of course be the same for all the for all three the, the columns. So it's J0 multiplied by lambda 1 is 1.517. Now we need the temperature at the center. So that is the body like that. You can go look at your sketches, it shows the radius in that direction. If we want to know what the temperature in the center is, then that temperature of the radius should be equal to zero divided by 0.12. However, the result is it is J0 for zero, for the value of zero. Right, now if you go and look in table 4.3, it gives you so the solution for the Bessel functions. It gives, this as a, it gives it as a function of eta, J0 in eta, and J1 in eta. So if eta is equal to zero, then this value is equal to one. And that value is equal to zero. Okay. The next value is typically if eta is 0 0.1, then that value is equal to 0 0.9, tri uh, sorry, triple nine seven five, and that value is equal to 0 0.04 triple nine, etc. So you can go and look at all the values. Now students again in the in the exams are so anxious. Now they look at this eta and they say, oh. Where must I get eta now? Okay. So this is eta. Okay, so eta is equal to zero. Eta is equal to zero. And therefore the value J0 of zero is equal to one. Coming back to this equation, it therefore means that this term becomes 1. You see? So therefore, <coughs> for the case of where it is equal to the center, then the temperature in the center, you can write it as TRT minus T infinite divided by TI minus T infinite is equal to a1 e to the minus lambda 1 squared and multiplied by 1. If you want to, you can also write it at 0. The temperature in the center it was already done for you in your textbook, so that equation is there. One term approach and the temperature at the center. Let's calculate it now. We want to know how long it will take before the temperature at the center drops to four degrees Celsius, minus, minus 10 to infinite, the environment temperature of the freezer is minus 10. The initial temperature was 37 minus, minus 10 is equal to A1, and A1 is equal to 2.027 multiplied by E to the minus lambda 1.517 square <coughs> multiplied by tau. Why did you set the labels on top of the table? I beg your pardon? Why did you set the values on uh, top of the table? Because it seems that uh, E1 and uh, lambda 1 are mixed. Yes, I also think I've made a mistake. Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, I've got a feeling A1 is first in the table, or is it lambda? Is it right? So it was right. Okay, okay, sorry, okay. So it was right. <laughs> okay, so that should be uh, lambda 1 and A1. Okay, and then this value here should be um, 
1.9898. That's right. Multiply it by zero. And this one should be 1.517. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the only unknown is the non-dimensionalized time. If we solve the non-dimensionalized time, it is equal to 0.396. Okay. Yep. I beg your pardon. The the on the exponent. Yep. 1.5, 1.517. It is 1.5. It's supposed to be also and put the one on the table. Okay. So I've made a mess with the, with the lambda ones and the A ones. You can just go and correct it. Okay? Just go and correct it. Uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the semester, you will know there's quite a difference in terms of what I say, some, say sometimes and what I mean. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, and you need to figure out what I mean. Okay? okay. So the non-dimensionalized time is 0.396. So whew, we can say. Fortunately, it is larger than 0.2, so the one-term approximation that we've made is valid. It's fine. Okay, now tau is equal to alpha t divided by r0 squared. And again, you'll say, now where does this formula come from? Again, table 4.1 in the fine print, it's there. Okay, it is there. 0.396 is equal to alpha, which is equal to 0.13 multiplied by 10 to the minus 6t divided by 0.12 squared. And the result is t is equal to 43,856 seconds, and that is equal to 12.2 hours. So that is how long it will take before the center temperature would be 4 degrees Celsius. Okay. So that is the first part of the problem. Let's, let's just go back to the problem. So this beef carcass, originally it was a 37. Then we put it in the freezer. In the freezer, the temperature is minus 10. The velocity is that and the transfer coefficient is that. So the temperature there was 37, and the question is, how long will it take? So if we look at the temperature at the center, this is time. This, at the beginning, it would be 37. And uh, minus 10 would be there. Let's put minus 10 there. So if this was the temperature in the beginning, and that is the temperature at the environment, then the temperature must always be between those two limits. After a very, very, very long time, then the temperature would go down to minus 10, if you leave it in the freezer. Okay. But we were specifically interested in when will it be 4 degrees Celsius, and that is 12.2 hours. So this is, I'm going to put the zero, zero there to indicate the temperature in the center. Now we want to know, at 12.2 hours, what will the temperature be on the outside? Okay, so will freezing occur? So will, will it ever get to zero degrees Celsius? So that's the second part of the problem. So the local temperature at the surface. Again, let's look at the equation of a cylinder. This equal the temperature, the non-dimensionalized temperature, Ti minus T infinite is equal to A1 e to the minus lambda 1 square multiplied by tau j0 lambda 1 r divided by r0.
Okay, so again, we're going to make the assumption of one term, but this is now something which previously was equal to 1, so let's look at this term on its own. So J0 of lambda 1 R divided by R0 is equal to J0 uh, is lambda 2.207 or 1.517, uh, which one it is, okay, doesn't matter. But now, <coughs> if this is the cocos, like that, Okay, and that is equal to R, then we want to know what the temperature is going to be here on the surface. So that is where R is equal to R0. R0 is equal to 0.12. Oh, not R0, the R is equal to 0.12 and R0 is equal to 0.12. Okay. So we need the value of J0 at 2.027 and that is the value of eta. So if you go and look at the table, J0 eta and J1 the basal functions, the zeroth order and the first order, then the values of 2 will be something the next one would be a 2.1 and you can choose 2, I would be happy with that. If you do the linear interpolation, this value is equal to 0.2083 and that value is equal to Now that we've got this term, we can go and do the calculation. And the calculation would be, we want to know what is the temperature on the surface, minus, minus 10, the temperature of 37, it's the initial temperature, minus, minus 10, is equal to 1.517, e to the minus 2.027 square multiplied by 0.396. Where do I get 0.396? This is the non-dimensionalized time that we've solved previously. Okay. So on this graph, this would be, in terms of tau, it would be 0.396. That's the non-dimensionalized time. Non-dimensionalized time of 0.396 is 12.2 hours. So we want to know, at 12.2 hours, what the temperature would be on the surface, but then we still have to multiply by that term, which is equal to 0.2083. Are you okay with that? Right, and if you solve it, you're going to get that the temperature on the surface is equal to minus 7.1 degrees Celsius. Minus 7.1. So if we go back to this graph, and we would put in this temperature at the surface, then the surface temperature is going to do something like that. So at 12.2 hours, that temperature there is going to be minus 7.1. That temperature, minus 7.1 degrees Celsius. Okay, so after 12.2 hours. Are you all happy with that? Okay. Um, mm. So, won't the heat conductivity of the water change as soon as it's Will the uh, heat conductivity change the moment it's frozen? Uh, yes, 
the thermal conductivity is a function of temperature. However, this, this thing tells us, or this problem tells us, that what you're doing is not a good idea, isn't it? Because you don't want the surface temperature to drop below zero, and that is exactly what happens. So the next part of the question can now be, what should we do to prevent it? Which means that you can now actually go do the problem okay. and determine and make sure that that temperature never drops below zero degrees Celsius, isn't it? And you can use exactly the same type of equations. Okay. So to prevent it, there are two things that you can do. Firstly is the T infinite can be increased. Minus 10 is maybe not uh, a good temperature. It should be, it shouldn't be, it should be a little bit higher. Okay. That's the first thing that you can do. And the other thing that you can do is you can decrease the velocity of the fan so that it's not 1.2 meters per second, it is lower so that the heat transfer coefficient, so this one will go with the heat transfer coefficient, so the heat transfer coefficient is a little bit lower. And those two things would, would help to ensure that this doesn't happen. A classical problem, which can also be done with this way, is in terms of oranges. Oranges in Mapumalanga, in, in winter, one of the very important things is that the temperature there shouldn't rise below zero degrees Celsius. And that can happen if a cold front moves over, over the area. Okay. And it might be that the cold front moves over and it is minus five, but you can do exactly these types of calculations to see if it is going to freeze or not. Okay. It's actually one of the, the problems in the textbook that you can look at. Okay. What we also have to remember, again, and I've mentioned it with a previous lecture, is that <coughs> if that is the cylindrical body, the beef carcass, then we have looked at heat transfer in that direction. So the heat was being transferred from the body to the environment, but we didn't consider these two surface areas. Okay. With paragraph 14.4, you will have the tools where you can actually now include this and redo the same problem and it will be more accurate. Also, just, let's just look at typically what will happen in the center of it. I'm going to draw it a little bit larger. Okay. So if that is the radius, and let's suppose that is the temperature on a scale here. Temperature is a function of radius. So in the beginning, the assumption was the temperature is 37 degrees Celsius right through the body. And if you go and do the calculations, it will correspond to what most of you would think. So if you start with the freezing, then the temperature at the surface is going to drop. But it's going to do little in terms of the temperature at the center, isn't it? So it's going to do something like that. Like that, and at a stage that temperature is going to start dropping. Okay. Until after a very long time, the temperature would be minus 10 right through. So minus 10, 37, and that is typically what's going to happen. So in our case, we actually had a temperature there of 4 degrees Celsius. And the temperature there was minus 7.1. And this line represents the time equal to 12.2 hours. And that can maybe be the line for 5 hours and 0.1 hours, etc. And this one, I don't know, would be obviously after a very long time 
not really infinite, but relatively large in terms of the time scales that has been considered. Again, I want to emphasize that you must remember, in terms of this temperature distribution that I've given, and coming back to the fact that there's no heat transfer through that surface and that surface, that if you look at this cylinder, the solution that it will give is it will tell you it's four degrees there, 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 and there, and there. And on this line, it is minus 7.1, it is minus 7.1, minus 7.1, and minus 7.1, and minus 7.1. So everywhere on this line, for a specific radius R, the temperature would be the same. And the temperature where it is equal to zero would maybe be there. So this is a limitation of the method that we're using at the moment because it's one-dimensional heat transfer. The heat transfer is only in this direction. That is where we've started with the equations and there's no heat transfer in that direction. The heat transfer in that, that direction is equal to zero. But in paragraph 4.4, then you will be given all the tools so that you can solve a problem like that also, but in a three-dimensional direction. Okay, let me just start with the next part of the work, paragraph 4.3, which is about transient heat conduction of a semi-infinite solid. Transient heat conduction of a semi-infinite solid. I'm going to refer to it as a SIS, semi-infinite solid, because it's too long to write out every time. So what is a semi-infinite solid? Firstly, it is an idealized body. with a single plane surface and it extends to infinite in all directions. So let me try to make a sketch of it. Let's suppose that is x, y, and z. So the first thing that is important with a semi-infinite solid is that there must be a plane surface. And the plane surface is this surface here. Okay. But it extends to infinite in all directions. So in that direction it is very long, in that direction very long, and in that direction also. So the question would now be, what are practical examples? Any suggestions that any of you have? So practical examples are 
close to the surface of the Earth. close to the surface of the Earth. If we look at the, the Earth like that, then obviously it is not a body that's infinite in size, but it's very large, isn't it? So for all practical purposes, if you go outside, then the Earth can be horizontal. Okay. And let's suppose there is a pipeline, a water line, underneath the Earth, Okay, like that. Then a practical example would be, let's suppose you've got snow at time equals zero. Now there's snow. The Earth was at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius or 15. And then the question would be, if this pipeline is maybe 1.8 meters underneath the surface of the Earth, will the water freeze? doesn't happen a lot in South Africa, but in many other countries it is a big issue. Then, a second example would be a region close to a surface. Any region close to a surface. Let's suppose this wall I don't know what the thickness is, but let's suppose it's about 300 millimeters thick. If we want to know how the temperature is going to change in the first few millimeters, if this air conditioning temperature maybe drops to minus 20, then we can, make, then we can also make the assumption that it is a semi-infinite solid. Not if we want the temperature at 150 millimeters, but if we want the temperature in the first few millimeters, then relatively in terms of the size of the body, it is small. And therefore we can use the semi-infinite solid method and we're going to do the theory of the derivation of it just now. And then thirdly, if it is for short periods of time, short periods of time. Another good example is a laser treatment. Okay. These days it is being used a lot in surgery and if that is maybe your arm, something like that, and they use this, this, the, laser, the laser for a very short period of time, then you can also make the assumption it is a semi-infinite body because everything is going to happen very close to the surface or very close to an organ. Okay. Now, together with this, there are two very important assumptions here. And that is that this temperature is constant at Ti and at T equals zero. At T equals zero, that temperature changes to Ts. Okay. So this body is at 15 degrees Celsius, it is stable, and then suddenly a cold front moves over, the temperature on the surface changes, then we can use the semi-infinite solid method. Also, if this is an organ in your body and there's a laser treatment at T equals zero, for a short period of time, then you can also make the assumption that it's a semi-infinite solid and the solution of it would actually give you a very good solution. A very good estimate of what is going to happen. Right, before we go through the next, uh, through the theory of this part, which, we, which I'm also going to do very, very quickly, we're going to get to the equations and then we're going to do an example just to show you how it is being used. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? If not, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.